Okay, there are some major important pharmacology topics which we will be discussing through our life. So, what are these important topics? So, already as we have posted earlier, what was that? That was about uh, the topics which we are going to discuss. But uh, along with that, in this life, guys, I would like to teach you people one of the important aspect. Uh, what is that? How the questions might be asked for your exam? And what are the important MCQs to be highlighted from the exam? So, all these things we are going to learn. And please remember, there is one thing I can guarantee tell you people. So, the upcoming for FMG exam, in that I can assure you that the 50% of the questions would be covered from this session itself. So, I want you to follow this session very keenly, very interestingly and this is a very, very, very important and very much score making subject pharmacology, right? So, let's start the discussion of pharmacology. So, in the pharmacology guys, always we will have one important thing that is your general pharma and all of you will hate it. As soon as I say general pharma, so we are sleepy, so we don't want to learn this much. So, I am going to make it simplified as much as possible for you and you people are going to enjoy it that much I can thoroughly guarantee, right? So, let's start with the pharmacology. So, in the pharmacology, as I have told you people, what is the first important discussion we are going to do? That is your general pharma. See, see when we are learning about general pharma, there are multiple approaches to it. What do I mean by this? See, some people would like to teach the general pharmacology. In the end, some people like to dedicate the general pharmacology in the starting. I would like to start with your general pharma, right? Now, when you are talking about general pharmacology, my dear students, it's very, very easy. But only thing is that you need to have your mind broadly open. What do I mean by this? So, general pharma will teach you some of the very interesting things. What is that first important thing? All of us know one thing called drug. What is a drug? It is a chemical. When it is uh, taken into the body, which will have a therapeutic or maybe some altering effects which can be present in the body. It is a simplified definition, I can call it. Now, in this drug administration, see I give you a tablet, you swallow the tablet. I give you an injection, either you might take an intramuscular or an intravenous injection. So, first important thing which we need to understand is root of administration, root of administration. So, what do I mean by root of administration? Easy for you to understand, guys. So, how exactly you are going to administer the drug? So, all the routes of administration is divided into two types, paraenteral and there is one more thing called as enteral route of administration. So, we have two routes, one of them is parenteral, another one is. Now, what do I mean by this parenteral? Parenteral is any route of administration which is not using the gastrointestinal tract, but enteral which using your, what is that? GIT, what is that? GIT, gastrointestinal being used. So, enteral route of administration. So, what are the two openings we have in the GIT? Of course, one to eat the food, one to defecate. Exactly speaking, what is that? Oral cavity. So, we can administer the drug orally and there is one more opening that is anal, that is rectal opening. So, we are going to administer it rectally. So, we have two route of administration called as peroral, peroral and there is one more thing called as per rectal administration. Now, guys, please understand per oral and per rectal administration, in both of these things, we are using intestine for the absorption of the drug. That is why we call it as a enteral root of administration. Now, parenteral. So, parenteral, we have IV root. Good. We have very good IM root. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. Yes, PDF will be available, of course. Okay. Now, apart from that, apart from that, we have subcutaneous. Very good. We have one important thing. All of you people will get confused that is only called as sublingual root of administration. So, guys, what is this sublingual root of administration? Basically, you are administering the drug under the tongue. What happens when you give a sublingual drug? What is going to happen? Directly, drug will get absorbed into the neck veins. What is that? Neck veins. Now, what are these neck veins? Basically, you are jugular veins. So, once you give the drug sublingually, it is neck veins. From there, it will reach the circulation. So, it will enter the neck vein and directly it will reach the circulation. It will reach the circulation. Now, if you notice here, so, so though we are using, what is that sir? That will be your, what is that? Oral cavity, but the drug is going into the systemic circulation. So, that is why I want you to understand that is a, a paraenteral root of admin. So, by now, you people should have a clarity. What is that? That is your, all the drugs which are administered using GIT for the absorption called as enteral point number one and point number two or anything else we 
reduce the administrative load para enteral cuff administration okay now guys let's continue to the next aspect so there are some other important uh, routes of administration that's the intra articular so when you are administering the drug into a joint into a joint for example we have some drugs which are administered in, into the what is that meninges basically that is your anesthetics which we are going to use that is on the intra thecal administration Right? Now, we, during these things, guys, I want you people to understand there is one important aspect. What is that? For sublingual, they might ask you people sometimes the examples of the sublingual root of administration. The classic one is your nitroglycerin. Classic one is a nitroglycerin. And in some countries, some hormonal pills also manufactured in the form of a sublingual pills. But one classic for your exam need to be remembered is nitroglycerin. How to administer nitroglycerin? Sublingual. Very nice. Sir. So, let's continue to the next step. See, guys, sir, see, it's very easy <coughs> in the roots of administration. This is very vague, like, you know, very simple to be understood, right? But uh, when you go to the next important aspect, of whatever the drug you give, right? So, what happens to that? Let's start with the most important chapter that is only called as pharmacokinetic, pharmacokinetics. So, to be frank, this route of administration in the exam point of view is a bit less important, but the pharmacokinetics is a big chapter and very important. And quickly we are going to go through. And whenever I say this is an important point, dear students, what you need to do? Make a note of it because that's going to be 100% sure. But MCQ people, so please be ready for that. Right now, <laughs> pharmacokinetics. So what is pharmacokinetics? That is effect of. That's effect of body effect of body on the drug body on the drug so basically what you are looking at you are looking at uh, basically you are looking at effect of the drug effect of the drug which is received effect of the effect of the effect of the body on to the drug i'm sorry effect of the body on the drug okay so what exactly your body will do to the drug we are going to call it as a pharmacokinetics so what and all your body can do the first important thing your body can absorb the drug absorption okay apart from absorption okay what it can do up after absorption see drug came into the body then drug has to get distributed all over the body we call it as a distribution distribution okay now apart from that after distribution what will it do it will do its work it do its work okay it will do its work but the important thing is that distribution is what? Distribution is a all over the body. The drug is getting distributed. Drug is getting distributed. Then you are going to look at metabolism of the drug. Is that metabolism of the drug? Metabolism of the drug. And the last one to be said, what is that? That is your, that is your, what is that? That is your excretion. That excretion. Very good. ADME. ADME. Very good. Devan. But the thing is that, guys, uh, I want you to understand absorption. This is a first aspect. Uh, what is that first aspect? Uh, the first aspect is absorption. So, what is the absorption? Let's learn. So, for that, uh, guys, uh, how exactly absorption occurs? For the absorption, the absorption of the drug might get occurred with the help of a passive diffusion. With the help of a passive diffusion. It's a simple process. Okay. The absorption of the drug can happen. With the help of what is that? With the help of active transport. So it is going to need some transporter. Active transporter, it is going to need some transporter for the absorption. Then there can be the most confusing part that is your phenocytosis. What is that? Phenocytosis. Now, when you are learning about phenocytosis, so phenocytosis is nothing but cell drinking, all of you learned that. So, when you are learning about phenocytosis, my dear students, phenocytosis is cell drinking through this route, drug can be absorbed. That is what I am trying to tell you. And the last and most confusing for you people, that is your phagocytosis. What is that? Phagocytosis. Now, the question will be what? Hello. So, what exactly the question? The question will be like this. All of the following are the methods of drug absorption except and most of the students will make a mistake right here where is that sir in the phagocytosis concept uh, what happens phagocytosis means cell eating sir we studied it in microbiology it doesn't mean you studied in microbiology it doesn't mean the same root of uh, same root of uh, what is that 
absorption cannot be present for the drug there is no rule like that so let's go to the next important aspect what is that factors affecting factors affecting factors affecting what factors affecting the absorption this is also very important aspect so what are the factors affecting the absorption so when we are learning about factors affecting the absorption guys look here what are the important aspects? The first and most important, what is a drug? Drug is a chemical. When it is a chemical, we need to look at something. What is that? That is your molecular weight. Molecular weight of the drug. Okay. Now, what do I mean by molecular weight of the drug? Remember like this. Size matter. How does size matter? The larger the drug, lesser the drug absorption. Larger the drug, lesser the drug absorption. Okay. Now, Phenocytosis, I'll explain again. Phenocytosis is a cell drinking. Okay. So basically it is a it's a little bit similar to that of phagocytosis in which substances can be engulfed into the cell. That's it. Okay. Now molecular weight. If you have a molecular weight, if it is more, if it is more, means the drug is larger. If the drug is larger, automatically what's gonna happen? If the drug is larger, absorption will be decreased. Absorption will be decreased if the molecular weight is more will decrease the absorption okay if molecular weight is less uh, automatically it will increase the absorption of the drug it will increase the absorption of the drug so this is the fact about your molecular weight so apart from the molecular weight uh, there are other important aspects so what are those important aspects see guys uh, what exactly is that the chemical nature of the drug i could like to tell you people what is the nature of the drug nature of the drug so what do i mean by nature of the drug so nature of the drug is nothing okay so recently all the substances can be acidic substances can be alkaline though substances if they are acidic or substance they are alkaline so what will happen to absorption let's understand okay now nature of the drug drug can be what is that one thing that is your acidic drug okay now if there is a acidic drug my dear students understand acidic drug will have a Increase of absorption, increase of absorption, where exactly? In the acidic media, the acidic media. So, wherever we have, wherever we have that acidic environment, what do you mean by acidic environment? Let's take out GIT. In the GIT, we have stomach, we have intestine, we have other parts. In the stomach, we have an acidic pH, but in the intestine, we have an alkaline pH. So, based on this, some drugs will be better absorbed from the stomach why because stomach has an acidic ph and if i have an acidic drug the drug will be better absorbed the drug will be better absorbed from where if acidic drug of course from the stomach if alkaline drug from the intestine so absorption is better in the acidic media so if there is a alkaline drug is it alkaline drug so there is an increase of absorption in the alkaline media in the alkaline media so most importantly guys understand the media where exactly drug is being absorbed that also matters that also matters so please understand about this one acidic and alkaline drug. okay apart from that is there anything else for the factors affecting the absorption so there are other factors such as your git factors what is it git factors okay so gastrointestinal tract factors what do i mean by gastrointestinal the factors which will affect from the GAT, but they will affect the absorption, such as gastric empty. What is it? Gastric empty. Okay. So, when you are talking about gastric empty, based on the nature of the drug, gastric empty might affect, might affect, might affect the absorption. Okay. For example, GIT pathologies, GIT pathologies, they will also affect the absorption. Okay. Apart from that, apart from that, the next important aspect, the next factors are your pharmacologic, pharmaceutical. See, so far we understood about other biological factors or not. We are going to understand pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical factors. Now, pharmaceutical factors. So, if I tell you people this term pharmaceutical, you people are going to confused. That is very easy. Pharmaceutical factors are nothing but we are talking about the drug itself. What do I mean by this? For example, we have powders. We have powders. Okay. We have powders. The next one we have is syrups. Okay. Then we have capsules. Now, which one will be absorbed faster? 
faster and take it. Let's see. Okay, I'm waiting for you to respond. Syrups are there. Okay, sir. Then I have powder, sir. I have capsules. Among these three, which is the better one you feel? So, Kiran Gopal says powder. What about others? Okay, syrup. Devanjan says powder. Okay, syrup. What makes you think syrup powder? What is the difference? Sir? Guys, please understand. Very good. Very good. So, most of the confusion is between your syrup and the powder. Okay. 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 Very nice. Sir. The answer goes to your, the correct answer is your syrups. Case. Correct answer is your syrups. Sir. What do you mean by syrups are the correct answer? Because look here. Syrup is in a liquid form. So, in the liquid form, the drug is already dissolved. If the drug is already dissolved, it can absorb very easily, very easily. So, that is what I am trying to tell you people. Syrups have a better absorption. So, syrups have a better absorption than powder. Powders have a better absorption than a capsules. Okay. Now, capsules. Yes. Yes, Dr. Manish. Okay. Now, capsules. Now, when you are talking about capsule, capsule have a different method of advantage. Okay, the different method of advantage is that the capsules can be used for the slow absorption of the drug. Okay, so that is a totally different aspect. But uh, when you are looking at a rate of absorption, very quickly happens in a syrup. Basically, the liquids will get absorbed very faster. Now, now we understood about absorption. Apart from that, there is one last thing that is only your solubility of the drug. Is it solubility of the drug? What do I mean by solubility of the drug? The solubility of drug, I mean to tell you people, is very simple. This drug can be usually two things. What is it? Lipid soluble. Lipid soluble. There can be one more possibility. That is your water soluble. Water soluble. Okay. Now, listen to me very carefully. What are the two types? Lipid soluble. Water soluble. Now, you people will tell me what is that? Lipid soluble will have better absorption or water soluble will have better absorption? Tell me. So, all of you will tell one answer only. What is that one answer? Let's see. Lipid soluble or water soluble, which is better absorption? Okay. So, all are telling me lipid, lipid, lipid soluble. So, guys, listen to me very carefully. Water soluble. Please understand it's very easy. That is your lipid soluble have better absorption. Lipid soluble will have better absorption. Why better absorption? Because lipid soluble drugs can easily cross the cell membrane. Easily cross the cell membrane. Because our cell membranes are made out of three substances. Protein, lipid, carbohydrate. Okay. Now in that lipid, that is your phospholipids. Now these phospholipids guys, phospholipids will have this particular importance. What is that? The drugs which are lipid soluble will be absorbed through this uh, phospholipid so will have a better absorption now water soluble drugs will require most of the time water soluble drugs require a transporter require a transport now you people will answer this question let's see which of the following is highest highest in the cell membrane. Now you people should answer me this. Okay. Now don't rush to the answer. Don't rush to the answer. I will give you the option. Don't rush to the answer. I have wrote the question. So some people will be rushing to the answer. Don't rush to the answer. I will give you four options. Option A. Protein. Option B. Lipid. Option C. Carbohydrate. Option D. None of the above. Okay, I need an answer quickly. Let's see. Protein, lipid, carbohydrate, none of the above. Okay, okay. All of, all of, most of you are telling me what is that? Lipid, lipid, lipid. Wow, wow, wow. Very nice, very nice. So, when I made this question, what makes you people think? So, when I know that, it is a directly, if I am telling you cell membrane has lipid, everyone knows Everyone knows that, right? If everyone knows that, I wouldn't put a trap for you. So, I have put a trap clearly. The answer is protein. Clearly, the answer is 
तो द फिफ्टी फाइव परसेंटेज ऑफ द सेल मेम्ब्रेन इज मेड आउट ऑफ प्रोटीन now why you people made a mistake here i'll tell you that also because all of you people learnt one thing what is that one thing you people learnt that was proteins are about are about less because you people used to think phospholipid what is that lipid bilayer membrane so from that lipid bilayer membrane what you have said it used to tell that lipids are what lipids are very rich but the answer is proteins guys proteins is the correct answer okay one myth busted one myth busted can you mark this question i am not joking this can be very important mcq now if i am only putting a trap for you don't you think examiner knows the trap for you definitely put a trap there got it so we are just getting started okay throughout the session i am going to give you all the surprises too many okay don't worry now enough of absorption you yeah, are bored right let's go to the next one sir absorption absorption how long okay let's go to the next one what is that upper absorption what should be there distribution okay now distribution distribution is very easy what is this distribution so distribution in the distribution itself i would like to teach you people one of the important concept called bioavailability but before going there distribution is what the drug reaching the drug reaching desired site of action so what happens here so distribution of the drug what is going to happen from the site of administration site of administration to where to one of the most important location to the tissues to the tissues so the distribution if it has to occur the most important again the factors the factors are very important see distribution factors are very much important look here what are those the first and most important factor of distribution is solubility of the drug Sir, already you told about solubility. Yeah, I told about solubility. See, in pharma, this is the what is that? Some factors will be present for both absorption and distribution. Okay, so listen to me very carefully. Solubility. If it is a lipid soluble, if it is a lipid soluble, it will cross all the membranes, such as, uh, for example, for example, blood-brain barrier, for example, blood-placental barrier. So, if it is a lipid soluble, it will cross the barrier. It will cross the barriers, such as blood-brain. if it cross the barrier it will reach wide range if it is a water soluble definitely the this again size matters i told you people right so what do i mean by this molecular weight molecular weight of the drug apart from that is there anything else sir yes there is one important thing this is the important concept plasma protein binding plasma protein binding now plasma protein binding capacity very easy to understand very interesting and most important thing look here what do i mean by this let's consider this is one okay now inside this blood vessel what do i have what do i have blood is the basic question so this blood what i have here i have it okay? now this drug is bound to the plasma protein what is a plasma now listen to me very carefully the drug came into the body to the route of administration from there the drug was absorbed now this absorbed drug is inside the blood vessel okay now in the blood vessel the drug was going like this it saw a beautiful girl that beautiful girl was plasma protein okay now to this beautiful girl drug went and attached got attached to the beautiful girl. now after the drug got attached to this beautiful girl what will happen he won't let go the drug will not let go of this beautiful girl who is that plasma protein so plasma protein is there to the drug is bound now if the drug is tightly bound is very much attached to that plasma protein automatically he will not get separated means plasma protein binding that will affect the drug distribution how exactly if there is a more if there is a higher plasma protein binding okay. if it is a high automatically what will happen to distribution he will remain in the blood vessel only if he strongly remaining in the blood vessel only he is not going into the tissues so desired site of action it will not reach so what i am trying to tell you people if the plasma protein binding capacity is higher it will lower the distribution lower the distribution now apart from that the next important aspect, what is that if the plasma protein binding is less plasma protein binding is less now that will lead to what is that increase of the distribution but uh, is there any use what are the uses of the plasma protein binding okay now the uses of the plasma protein binding see if it is strongly bound it is dissociating slowly if the drug is dissociating slowly now this makes advantage what is that see 
drug came into the body now the drug is the drug is increasing what is that it is increasing See, that is increasing one of the most important aspect what is that duration means more long it is bound the drug is slowly slowly getting slowly slowly getting removed into the tissues so automatically it will increase the increase the duration of action it will increase the duration of action okay now apart from that drug will remain drug will remain in the body for a longer period of time means a drug can be stored in the body drug can be stored in the body so it is a sense of saying drug can be stored in the body okay now if plasma protein binding is there there is one more thing what is that that is only called as that is only called as one of the most interesting concept that is called as displacement what is a displacement okay now i told you people what is that there is a plasma protein this is a beautiful girl he was bound to a drug okay now what i'll do i'll send in one more handsome guy here so there is a new drug there is a new drug now once new drug comes he will come and bind with the plasma protein and he will kick the old guy out he will kick the old guy out. now this drug will become alone this drug will become alone. so if there is a displacement what will happen suddenly the drug will become free in a large quantity if more quantity of drug becomes a free that might lead to toxicity displacement can lead to toxicity of the drug very easily toxicity of the drug is so throughout this uh, what is the what is the take home message if you know that there is some displacement reaction occurred with the help of drug by any drugs now this condition you need to be very careful you need to be very careful because that might lead to toxicity very easily very good okay now now once you understood about this uh, once you understood about this uh, let's go to the next important aspect that is only your ef what is that ef what do i mean by ef that is only your bioavailability now what do i mean by bioavailability guys bioavailability is very easy for you to understand bioavailability is uh, very simple what do i mean by this guys the quantity of drug quantity of drug reaching systemic circulation reaching systemic circulation systemic circulation in unchanged form definitely you people are getting bored when i tell you the definition unchanged form i'll explain you people very easy to listen to me what happens let's consider you gave a drug what is that drug let's take one acidic drug or anything okay. now you gave one drug x whoever it may be drug x now this drug gets absorbed and it will go to where it will go to the liver now this drug x when it comes to the liver the drug can get metabolized drug can get metabolized okay after metabolism after metabolism whatever the drug the remaining drug the remaining drug will go to the circulation the remaining drug will go to the circulation so what do i mean by this i mean by this it's very easy the remaining drug whatever is going to the circulation means for example in the starting if i give 100 mg of the drug now in the end i'm getting only 60 mg of the drug now this 60 mg of the drug is only reaching i'm going to call it as a bioavailable drug what do i mean by this the drug which is going into the circulation how much 60 mg in a unchanged form in a unchanged form this is only your bioavailability okay now when you are learning about bioavailability so you need to understand the measure of bioavailability measure of f that is your bioavailability how exactly you are going to measure that okay okay so once you need to understand understand that is uh, what is that measure of bioavailability it is used with the help of some concept called as area under the curve with the help of a concept called as area under the curve. now what do i mean by area under the curve let's take one simple method here and understand now look here guys here what i'm going to <coughs> tell you people here will be time here will be time and here i'm going to tell you yeah, i'm going to write what what is the plasma concentration plasma concentration okay 
Now, when you're looking about a time and the plasma, for example, at zero point of time, I gave a tablet. Okay. After 10 minutes, the drug is here. Means, what do I mean by this? I mean by this is, uh, for example, at a given point of time, for example, let's take one hour. After one hour, the plasma concentration was this. So, what happens is that you gave a drug orally, start to absorb, absorb. With time, what will happen? The quantity of drug will be increased in the plasma concentration. It will reach up to a peak, means the maximum. After that, what will happen? Drug will start to get metabolized. Slowly, the quantity of drug will start to go down. Okay. So, at this point of time, the concentration. Now, look here. The point point this one is maximum constant so you'll need to look at two factors here. what are the two factors the one factor is uh, one factor is your what is that that is your the time taken for the drug to reach a maximum concentration we are going to call it as a team we are going to call it as a t max the t max so t max we are writing in this line so we call it as a t max okay time now, in this line here, we are going to call this as a C max. What do I mean by C max? The maximum concentration. The maximum concentration. That is C max. So, they might give you a graphic picture and ask you people, what is the time taken to reach this particular? So, I will put a graph like this. Okay. And I will point it as A. So, what is the time taken for this, for this drug to reach A point? We will call it as a C max. We'll call it as a T max. Now understand the concentration where it is reaching the T max. We call it as a concentration max. But here I want you people to understand there is one more thing. So at this some level we have something called as M E C. Now what is this M E C? This is a very important M C Q that is minimum effective. Concentration minimum effective. So, what do I mean by minimum effective concentration? So, listen to me. For example, T max of a drug, T max of a drug is 50 mg per ml. Let's consider random drug, random number. The maximum concentration, how much it can go? 50 mg per. Okay. Very good, very good. Now, listen to me here, maximum. But the concentration of 30 mg per ml itself start of action, start of action. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's understand. I gave a painkiller, right? I gave a painkiller, the maximum it can reach is 50. Maximum it can reach is 50. But at the 30 itself, pain will start to decrease in the patient. So, at minimum, what is the minimum concentration that has to be present in the blood vessel so that effect will be seen? That is only called as MEC, which is also called as minimum effective concentration. Minimum effective concentration. So, this is the most important aspect which you need to understand MEC, right? So, measure of bioavailability. Now, if you notice here, guys, this area, whatever which is present, Whatever which is present under this curve, whatever which is present under this curve, we are going to call it as a area under. So, area under the curve. Now, this will be called as area under the curve, right? Now, this area under the curve which I have depicted is more of oral drug administration. Now, what is that AUC? AUC for IV. Now, this can be a picture based question. In the last exam, the general pharma related question was more. So, please understand how does a AUC for a IV looks like. It would look like this. Now, understand at zero time, in the starting itself, what did you do? You gave a drug IV. If you give a drug IV, the large quantity of drug went into the vein. If the large quantity of drug went into the vein, at zero point of time, the maximum concentration will be there. So, this would be the starting point. Now, from there, with time passes, the drug concentration will start to fall down and your curve might go like this. So, if you look at here, this is a curve where at the zero, this is a zero time. Zero time is the point where you gave an injection. So, at this point of time, a large quantity of drug is present. At zero itself, we have your 
highest concentration of the drug with the time the drug quantity is going down now whatever area which is present under this curve we are going to call it as a AUC for the IV so they might ask you a question by giving a picture above picture depicts uh, which of the following roots uh, area under the curve that might be IV or oral so the first one I told was oral okay so once you understood about this there is a last important what is that last important aspect that important aspect guys there is one important question look at this MC which of the following which of the following which of the following conditions have conditions have high distribution high distribution for water soluble drug for a water soluble drug okay. this is a question option a congestive heart failure option b what is that that is your nphs mutation nphs mutation option c that is your chronic liver disease option d all the way yes guys tell me the answer yes of course below mac there is no mechanism of action now i'd like to see the comments tell me the answers very quickly let's see yeah So, what is the relationship here? I am asking you people, water soluble drug should have a highest distribution in which of the following condition. So, this is my question, okay. Some people, Ashwan says that is your CHF, okay. What about others? Others, uh, others are not even answering. Tell me, tell me quickly, take a guess. If you don't know the answer, you need to take a guess. What will take a guess? So, when you don't know the answer, A, B, C, D, C. In FMG exam, do you lose any mark? No, right? If you are not losing any mark, then why you are being worried about it, you need to take a guess. Tell me, tell me. Yeah, guys, please. Okay, somebody says C. Okay. What about others? Others, are, sir, like literally we didn't understand the question. Okay, oh, very good. CLD. Okay, now CLD, I will tell you how, what you thought. You people thought, okay, drug C is talking. If he is talking about drugs, that means it is metabolized, most of the drugs are metabolized in the liver. So, let us answer as a chronic liver disease. Right? The answer is not that one also. Now, the correct answer, my dear students, the answer is all of the above. The answer is all of the above. Why all of the above? In all of these following conditions, we have one common factor that is your edema. That is your edema. In the edema, there is an increase of distribution, increase of distribution of what? Of your one of the interesting drugs that is your water soluble drugs. Water soluble drugs. So, please understand the water soluble drugs will have, will have what is that? That is your better distribution during edema. Why? Because during edema, all the body tissue, all the body, all over the body, the fluid is accumulated in the tissue. If fluid is accumulated, what will happen? The drug can be dissolved in the water. Now, it can go into the tissues and accumulate very easily. Okay. So, be ready. See, I knew. Now, most of you people are thinking, sir, what the hell is this NPHS mutation? We have no idea. Okay. Now, listen to me very carefully. NPHS is a gene in which what will happen? Nephrotic syndrome will occur. NPHS 1 and NPHS 2 gene mutations will lead to nephrotic syndrome, congenital nephrotic syndrome. Now, congenital nephrotic syndrome patients will also, any nephrotic syndrome patient will have a edema. In the patients with edema, again, the drug, water-soluble drug will have a better disease. Got the point? Okay, let's continue the next one. What is the next one? So, once we understood about distribution, my dear students, let's go to the next important aspect that is your metabolism. That metabolism. Now, once we need to understand about the metabolism, metabolism is very important. Metabolism can also be called as biotransformation. 
bio transformation okay now what is this bio transformation let's see now what happens is that during a bio transformation be very simple drug came drug came okay now once drug came now the next important aspect what happened distributed now drug has to get metabolized now if drug has to get metabolized how exactly it will occur let's understand what and all can happen now we have a active drug we have a active drug the drug is active outside of the body itself comes into the body it will do its action become an inactive drug inactive drug or inactive metabolite see after metabolism we call it as a metabolite inactive metabolite inactive metabolite very good now the next important thing what can happen is the drug is inactive the drug is inactive okay it comes into the body comes into the body and the drug becomes active drug becomes active we call this concept as a pro drug we call this concept as a pro drug so when you're learning about pro drug pro drugs are what pro drugs are a group of drugs which are active in the body but they should be activated in the body which are inactive outside of the body outside of the body inactive comes into the body they will undergo the effect of some enzyme become an active drug we call it as a pro drug now in the pro drugs you need to give me some examples give me some examples guys let's see okay what are the examples for pro drugs all of you don't learn one of the most important drug you should all know what is that that is your l dopa what is that your l dopa that is your levodopa what is that levodopa levodopa okay now apart from levodopa there are other drugs such as ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitors, classically we have enalpyrin, we have enalpyrin, now this enalpyrin is a inactive drug, the inactive drug becomes active in the body, okay, now, now, there are other, other substances, there are so many other products, okay, these are the two important things I wanted to remember, let's go to the next one, what is that? The inactive to active understood the most and interesting aspect of that is your active drug. Active drug becomes active metabolite. This is an interesting concept. Why? See, all of the examiners knows that you people will remember what is that? That is your that is your what is that? That is your pro drug. He is gonna ask you active drug becoming an active. So, active drug becoming an active metabolite is a very important question. That is examples. Sir. Can you give me some examples? Very good. Very good. What is that? That is your diazepam. Diazepam, the most important metabolite. So, look here. Diazepam will get converted into one of the active metabolite called as oxyzepam. Oxyzepam. This is the important metabolite among others. This is the most important metabolite you people should know. Diazepam becomes oxyzepam. This is the most important active metabolite. Okay. Now, please listen to me very carefully. This might be MCQ. Why this is a MCQ? See, listen to me very carefully. Now, this diazepam becomes a active metabolite called as oxyzepam. Because of this, because of this, you need to know these drugs. These drugs, especially benzodiazepine. There are other benzodiazepines also which give rise to other active metabolites other active metabolites among which you need to know diazepam so diazepam when you are using now these metabolites also excreted by the liver and this drug can go to toxicity very easily so you need to be very careful when you are using what is that benzodiazepine elder patient in a elder patient because easy toxicity and easy excessive sedation can occur in the patients of elderly age the next important aspect of that is your Codeine, guys. What is that? Codeine. What is that? Codeine. Codeine gives rise to active metabolite called as oh, morphine. Okay. Now listen to me. Codeine is right now not widely used anywhere, but codeine earlier it was used for treatment. Codeine earlier it is used for treatment of what is that? Dry cough. What is that? Dry cough. Now this dry cough treatment 
after taking it it will go get into morphine morphine is a opioid even though codeine is also a opioid but morphine is having higher addiction tendencies uh, that that can lead to one of the dangerous aspect that is addiction these are the two important drugs i want you people to remember active drug to active metabolite okay now now once you understood about metabolism metabolism most common site of metabolism most common site of metabolism is liver 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 so in the liver what exactly happens is that there is something called as something called as rt williams rt williams classification rt williams classification of the reaction rt williams classification of the liver reaction so liver metabolizing the drug that uh, metabolism is classified with the help of rt williams classification rt williams classification says that there is a phase 1 reaction okay and there is one more thing called as phase 2 reaction how many phases see when i say phase 1 automatically your answer should be there is one more thing called as phase 2 of course now what is a phase 1 now phase 1 reaction all of them are usually simple reactions uh, they are very easy to remember also now the question comes to you people see easy reaction if you tell to examiner you can get out so you need to understand what you need to understand phase one reactions are your microsomal reaction so all this microsomal reaction to occur in the liver they are your phase one reaction okay and there is a phase two reaction what is that phase two reaction they are your non-microsomal reaction okay now among this you can also call it as uh, what is that the phase one reactions are usually usually synthetic reaction means they are going to synthesize some but here non synthetic reaction what is a non synthetic okay now what exactly this phase one reaction for example you talk about oxidation you talk about oxidation the phase one reaction you talk about cyclization the phase one reaction okay you talk about decyclization decyclization is also a phase one reaction. for example you talk about simple reactions such as hydrolysis hydrolysis all this very very easy and basic reactions are your well, reaction now non microsomal reactions such as glucuronidation glucuronidation now glucuronidation reaction is a reaction in which what happens is that the water soluble substance are being generated why water soluble substance is generated because see what is the target of the metabolism drug has to be reduced. so you people are getting confused administration distribution metabolism after metabolism drug has to be eliminated so if the drug has to be eliminated how it has to be water soluble so after which reaction with the help of one of the reaction is glucuronidase after glucuronidation what will happen this fat soluble drug will become into water soluble drug okay now see why phase one reaction called as a functional functionalization reaction see we already established one thing here doctor that is your synthetic reactions right if there is synthetic reaction means this is not the reaction in which complete drug might not be metabolized for example we discussed about earlier what was that that was your Remember here, what is that prodrug? In the prodrug, again the reaction occurred where exactly? The liver itself. In the liver itself. But the con concept you need to understand is that if the drug was inactive, in which what happened? The drug became active, right? So here the drug is becoming functional. So that is why we can call it as functionalization reaction also. So phase one reactions are not ultimate end of the drug. Got the point? Okay. Now, <laughs> let's go to the next important. Glucuronidation. Glucuronidation is a reaction. What is that? That is what happens here is that, what is that? Here, fat soluble substances will get converted into water soluble substances. We have other reactions such as methylation. Such as methylation. Okay. Apart from that, apart from that, apart from that, for example, there are other drug reactions. Sulfur. Sulfur, <laughs> sulfur reaction. We can also call it as a sulfization feature. We can also call it a sulfur reaction. Okay. Now, now this special reaction 
the special reactions which has that is your non microsomal action non microsomal reaction now methylation there are some drugs which undergo methylation reaction anybody tell me the drugs which undergo methylation reaction let's see see it's not more about it's less about the site rather it's more about your <laughs> this functional the drug becoming functional Okay, anybody tell me the drugs which undergo methylation? So, the drugs which undergo methylation, example of the drugs undergo methylation, undergo methylation, okay, methylation and there are some other drugs and there are some other drugs examples of the drugs undergo acetylation acetylation okay now methylation there are many groups there are many groups of drugs which are less important but the examples of the drugs undergo acetylation very important these are see here we have drugs. There are few antibiotics which undergo methylation there. Okay. But here the drugs which undergo acetylation are very important. What are those? They are your ship drugs. What is your ship drugs? So this is standard pneumonia. We use what are those? Sulfur drugs. Sulfur drugs. Okay. For a <coughs> H for hydralazine. H for hydralazine. Okay. Now apart from that, I for isoniazid. Isoniazid. P for procanamide, 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 then D for dapson, D for dapson. Okay. Now please understand hydralazine, isoniazid, procanamide and dapson. These are the drugs which undergo which reaction? Acetylation. Now please understand about this concept. What is that? The same drugs are the same drugs can also lead to one important problem that is your drug induced SLE. These drugs can also lead to drug induced SLE. Among those most important, I wanted to remember hydralazine. Hydralazine, classic example which can induce the drug induced systemic lupus erythematosus. So, so far we discussed about metabolism. Right? Now, metabolism is done by the liver in. So, once there is a liver enzyme, one of the most important thing that is only called as inducers. Now, inducers definitely 100% they will be MCQ. They will be MCQ. Now, what is this MCQ? Look here, enzyme inducers. Basically, they increase the liver enzyme activity. They increase the liver enzyme activity. Now, my dear students, you people will tell me, liver enzyme activity, if they increase, please tell me, what will happen to the drug metabolism? For example, I have one drug, drug A, okay. Now, drug A is an inducer. I have drug B. It has no effect. It has no effect whatsoever. No effect whatsoever on what is that? On your enzyme, okay. We have two drugs. One drug is drug A. One is B. Now, A is an inducer. B is having no effect on the enzyme. Now, I'll combine them both. What will happen? I'll give to the patient. Now, once I give it to the patient, what will happen? It will increase the metabolism. Agreed. Increase the metabolism of only one drug, all, all the drug. Increase the metabolism of all the drugs in the body. Increase the metabolism of the all the drugs in the body. So, for example, when you give an inducer, what will happen? It will lead to excessive enzyme activity, which might lead to. So, increase the metabolism of all the drugs. Automatically, if all the drugs get metabolized, it will lead to therapeutic system. Therapeutic failure. Therapeutic failure. So, what I am trying to tell you people is that, for example, if you combine any enzyme inducer, that will lead to, that can lead to therapeutic failure if doses are not adjusted properly. We will understand that with a classic example. But before going there, let's, let's understand the drugs. What is that? Griseofulvin. Griseofulvin. Okay. We have phenytoin. We have phenytoin. Okay. Apart from phenytoin, we have one more drug called as rifampicin. Rifampicin, okay. Yes, for smoking. 
we have one more <coughs> effect that is smoking then we have carbamazepine we have carbamazepine carbamazepine okay then we have one more drug that is your phenobarbital phenobarbital okay now all these drugs all these drugs are your enzymes but how to remember g p r s c p what is that the mnemonic classic mnemonic used <laughs> used everywhere that is your g p r s cell phone so with the g p r s cell phone what you can remember that is your the drugs which are enzyme inducer very good gprs cell phone okay now griseofulvin phenytoin rifampicin smoking carbamazepine phenobarbital now what exactly happens is that a 23 year old recently married recently married female came to hospital hospital with upt positive but on ocps but on ocps she was started she was started treatment of ptb Three months back. UPT can be explained. UPT can be explained by. Let's look at the option. Option A Isoniazid. Isoniazid. Option B Rifampicin. Option C, Ethambutol. Option D, Aldehyde. Okay, yes. tell me the answer. So, the answer is what? 23 year old recently married female came to the hospital with a UPT positive. Urine pregnancy test was positive. Okay, she, but she was on the OCP. If she was on the OCP, there is less likely or impossible that she must be pregnant. See, it's not impossible, but less likely that she can get pregnant. But the important aspect is that she was started with the pulmonary TB treatment. So, TB treatment consists of what? Four drugs. Isoniazid, rifampicin, ethambutal, pyrazinamide. Among these drugs, which can explain the condition? This can be explained by your correct answer. Very good. Rifampicin. What rifampicin does, sir? The rifampicin will induce the metabolism. Rifampicin will induce the metabolism of other drugs. Now, this is a this is a repeat question which was asked very recently. So, be careful, guys. This is a very important question. Okay. Now, now let's go to the next important. Where there is an inducer, there should be an inhibitor. What is that next important aspect? We are going to understand enzyme inhibitors. What is that? Enzyme inhibitors. So, what are the inhibitors? These enzyme inhibitors are the group of drugs which inhibit the liver enzyme, which inhibit the liver enzyme. Now, when we are talking about this inhibitor, so inhibitors are very easy for you to understand. These inhibitors, guys, we have the drugs such as itaconazole. What is it? Itaconazole. Okay. Now, there one drug, antifungal drug, that was your bisophilin. Here one antifungal drug, ketoconazole. Now, some people will tell me, sir, we will remember it with mnemonic. I will tell you people one major problem. If you remember pharmacology with mnemonics, there is a major issue. What is that major issue? That major issue is that at the end of the day, you will forget. See, P is present in a mnemonic. Okay. P for what is that? Pyranzapine, pilocarpine phenytoin phenobarbiton you will not be able to understand which drug is which one during the exam so don't remember complete pharmacology with the help of mnemonics please please do not do that okay now there is one drug ketoconazole okay there is one more drug that is your cimetidine what is it cimetidine now cimetidine also causes one side effect also causes causes one side effect what is that side effect can anybody tell me Okay, I am waiting for the answer. Let me continue the other drugs. There we had an anti-epileptic drugs. Here also we have one more drug. That is your valproate. Okay, there we had one anti-TB drug. Here also we will have one more 
anti tb drug what is that anti tb drug isoniazid isoniazid okay now the side effect is your gynecomastia gynecomastia okay now gynecomastia is a side effect this is a side effect caused by your simetidine again which is a very important mcq which was asked earlier early not even earlier time around 2019 20 it was asked not very old question okay now again this question can also come up for you people how exactly see in recent times the question should not be direct so it can be clear a patient was patient was taking treatment of tb taking treatment also also was on benzodiazepine for anxiety for the now suddenly after after anti tb treatment anti tb treatment overdose overdose of benzodiazepine occur can be caused by which drug can be caused that is the question. option a itaconazole now don't rush to the answer Taconosol, option B, valproate, valproate, option C, isoniazid, isoniazid, option D, refam. Okay, tell me, let's see. See acute alcohol, we are not looking at enzymes here, that is totally a different story. Acute alcohol will have a totally different spectrum of symptoms. Okay, don't confuse. Okay, Devanjan says, see, what about others? Others are like, sir, we are like, we are confused, maybe ketoconazole, maybe valproate, right? Okay, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad says, see, any other answers? Only two people are telling the answer, rest are there. Okay, everybody says C. Very good. The answer is C because you people might answer as a ketoconazole, but don't answer ketoconazole. Here we are already clearly telling anti TB drug was also taking benzodiazepine for the anxiety. Now we give a once uh, isoniazid is given, suddenly overdose might occur due to enzyme interaction. This can be a MCQ which can be asked again. So be very careful. Okay, now. We understood about the inducers, we understood about the inhibitors. The next important aspect uh, that is your excretion of the drug. Excretion. Excretion of the drug. Now, when you want to understand the excretion of the drug, most common route that is your kidney. Most common route is your kidney. Okay. Now, in the most common route is kidney, guys, understand one of the important aspects. What is that? Most common route is uh, your kidney but the most important there is a elimination this elimination of the drug will occur with the help of something called as zero order kinetics and there is one more thing called as first order kinetics first order now what is this zero order kinetics zero order kinetics there is a constant all of you know constant amount is eliminated constant amount is eliminated what do i mean by this for example i have 100 mg of a drug in the blood okay now you people might have by heading blindly what is that that is uh, the calculation do not calculate see there is no rule that always 100 mg will only be there now there is no rule that always 100 mg of the drug will be present in the blood, right so you don't just remember the numbers remember this one constant amount is eliminated constant amount is eliminated what do I mean by constant amount is eliminated? Now look here guys. For example, this 100 mg of the drug after 1 T half. After 1 T half, for example, the drug becomes some 80 mg of the drug. So here how much is removed? 
20 mg zinc. Okay. Now, the next T half will occur. Now, here what will happen? 60 mg it will become. So, if you notice again 20 mg. There is a fixed quantity. Here is not about the percentage. Here is about a fixed quantity of the drug discovery in it. So, for this, uh, the classic examples are the drugs which eliminate by zero order. So, there is one classic example. See, God is very brilliant, I can say. Why God is very brilliant? Because the classic example you need to remember is your alcohol. Sir, there are other drugs also. Na? What are those? Uh, we have something called a zero watt power as a mnemonic. See, among those, except for alcohol, except for alcohol, except for alcohol, other drugs can follow sometimes first order kinetics also, sometimes mixed order kinetics also. So, there is a fixed always one substance which will undergo, what is that? Zero order kinetics alcohol. Just imagine how brilliant God should be. Once a person drinks alcohol, all of a sudden complete alcohol cannot be metabolized because only fixed amount will be removed. Fixed amount will be removed. So, this is your alcohol. Now, first starter kinetics. So, in the first starter kinetics, what happens here? Constant fraction of the drug is eliminated. What is that? Fraction of the drug is eliminated. Here, for example, 100 mg of the drug is there. Now, this 100 mg of the drug, after 1 T half, for example, 1 T half, it will become 50 mg. Now, if you notice here, what happened? 50 percentage of the drug is gone. Now, next 1 T half will occur. It will become 25 mg. Okay. So, what happened here again? 50 percentage of the drug is being removed. So, whenever fixed percentage of the drug is eliminated, that will be your zero. Uh, that will be your first order kinetics. Uh, now, zero order kinetics. The classic example I want you to is alcohol. But please, please do not uh, do not put yourself in a position where you'll remember other drugs. But I'll give you the examples. Uh, zero order kinetics. Other examples such as warfarin. Warfarin. Again, these drugs. Again, I'm telling these drugs. There is no fixed rule that. They will always follow zero order kinetics. Yes, the mostly they follow zero order kinetics, but they can shift first order kinetics also. Okay. Okay. Then there is alcohol. There is one more drug, aspirin. There is one more drug, aspirin. Okay. Then we have, for example, one more drug that is dolbutamide. Dolbutamide. Okay. Then most important aspect. What is that? That is your, that is your phenytoin. That is your phenytoin. Phenytoin. Okay. So, all these drugs, all these drugs undergoes your, what is that? That is your zero order kinetics. But remember, remember that is, well, fixed one is alcohol. Fixed one is alcohol. This concludes all the important questions, all the important MCQ parts related to your, related to your pharmacokinetics pharmacokinetics okay ethanol ethanol is basically alcohol see that is only edible alcohol okay? so please uh, all of you remember one thing so how many of you during lockdown when you are not getting alcohol but you wanted to drink alcohol how many of you drink hand sanitizer none of you why you didn't drink hand sanitizer hand sanitizer was available now it smells like alcohol only it is alcohol only it has methanol we could have drank it right why we don't drink it Yeah, tell me, let's see how many of you can answer. Why didn't you drink hand sanitizer during lack of alcohol during the time of what is that? During the time, oh, because we have brain. Yeah, we have brain. What did your brain tell? Yeah, brain would have told now, bro, it smells like odka. Let's drink it. But no, you didn't drink. Why? Because remember, methanol is a, it's not about distilled, nothing. Okay, listen. Methanol is such a substance which will create a toxic metabolite. Toxic metabolite called as formaldehyde which is a toxic to your eyes. It can lead to eye damage. Okay. So, if you don't get alcohol, it's okay to have withdrawal symptom but don't drink hand sanitizer because it is toxic to your eyes. It can lead to loss of vision. Eyes gone. Very good. This is only called as huge tragedy. Huge tragedy from forensic people who have studied. So, whenever we say alcohol, 
we are talking about consumable alcohol in the pharmacology except for one place where we are talking about disinfectants okay in other places it has interaction with alcohol means we are talking about ethanol only ethyl alcohol which is a drinkable alcohol all right very good so this is a story of your story of your pharmacokinetics why i took so much time in the revision session for your pharmacokinetics because there is a lots and lots of issues and lots of understanding required so that is why okay so with this much being said let's take a short break let's take a short break then we will continue all right okay we'll take a short break right so guys so far we discussed about pharmacokinetics you people might be thinking why did i give a break very quickly the reason behind it is very simple i don't want to saturate your brain because you need to take the information of upcoming topics so that will be very easy after general pharma's most important topic that was your pharmacokinetics let's go to the next important aspect pharmacodynamics pharmacodynamics is very easy for you people so what is pharmacodynamics pharmacodynamics is a very easy and interesting thing. now so far we studied about one thing what is that effect of the drug on the body we are going to study about the effect of the drug on the body okay, earlier we studied about effect of the body on the drug right that was pharmacokinetics now we here we are going to study effect of the drug on the body the body effect of the drug on your body so what and all a drug can do to your body is what you are going to learn in a chapter called as pharmacodynamics in the pharmacodynamics okay, it's very easy so somebody has asked me what is the difference between ethanol and so structurally speaking carbon methanol is made out of single carbon and ethanol is made out of two carbon atoms okay now methanol is usually used as a dis ethanol is usually consumable alcohol. okay now let's continue now whatever we are looking here does it sound like mechanism of action of the drug so how any of the drugs can work in the body so look at those mechanism of action. the first and most important mechanism of action for example bactericidal so you have your antibiotics so those antibiotics can kill the microorganism or for example bacteriostat bacteriostatic okay so this is one type of example apart from that the drugs can also do other things such as enzymatic action that enzymatic action what do i mean by enzymatic usually the drugs will go and inhibit an enzyme inhibit an enzyme. any enzyme for example let's take it in a sense it an enzyme cyclooxygenase or a cox cox enzyme that is a enzymatic for example you have one action called as placebo so basically here we are not going to give the original drug but patient will think that there is a body so this is a type of <coughs> placebo action there is one more action called as nocebo action what is it nocebo action so these both actions are most importantly they are majorly psychological factor action your psychological factor so in nocebo what happens usually there is no side effect but patient will think that because of your treatment only there is some problem came up okay that also we can that that is a type of action now this placebo and nocebo are not so much important what is our favorite thing that is your receptor mechanism action that receptor mechanism action. now receptor mechanism of action most of the people feel very difficult so let's start with very basic understanding of this particular mechanism so let's start with one cell right let's start with one cell. now in this cell we have a cell now on this cell membrane on this cell membrane i have some person now for example i will have two drugs drug a and i'll have one more drug drug b now when drug a acts on this receptor it will activate for example some enzyme now because of this enzyme there is some there is some so because of drug a what happened there is a activation of some enzyme and there is a 
action. Now this type of activity which occurs inside the cell we call it as a intrinsic intrinsic action. Intrinsic. Okay. Now let's take about drug B. Now drug B when it acts there is no action at all. No action inside the cell whatsoever. So if I have a drug and add this drug on that receptor we go and bind. We go and bind to the receptor but there is zero action inside. So, whatever action occurs inside the cell, based on that, the receptor mechanism is divided. Based on that, receptor mechanism. For example, we have some drugs called as agonist. Agonist. We have one more drug called as antagonist. We have one more drug called as antagonist. Now, when you look at a receptor action, you need to look at two factors. What are the two factors? One of them is called as affinity. One of them is called as affinity. The another one called as intrinsic activity. What is a intrinsic activity? So whatever the activity occurs inside the cell, okay, and and one more thing, affinity. Affinity means what? Ability to bind. Now look here. I had two drugs. Drug A one. I had one more drug. Drug B. Now if I gave it drug A, there is an intrinsic activity present. So, now drug A went and bound to the receptor and because of that there is an activity. Means drug A is binding to the receptor. Sir. Okay. And there is some intrinsic activity. Yes, sir. The intrinsic activity is present. But let us give the number of this intrinsic activity as plus 1. See this plus 1 and minus 1 which I am going to use. It, it is just for a understanding. Okay. The numbers which we are using is just for a understanding. So, now look here. Antagonist. Now antagonist, let us take drug B. Now drug B is also binding to the receptor but there is no intrinsic activity, right? So means it will go and bind with the receptor that is antagonist but there is no intrinsic activity which I will give. So agonist is such a type of drug which will go and bind with the, which will go and bind with the receptor, agree, okay, but it will have a strong intrinsic. Antagonist is such a substance, no intrinsic. So, based on that, we have one more type of substance called as inverse agonist, inverse agonist, and there is one more substance called as partial agonist. See, any of the drug, if it is working through a receptor, all of them will have a ability to bind to the receptor. So, affinity is present for both of them. But in let's start with a partial agonist. Partial agonist is present but intrinsic activity partial means what a little bit so the intrinsic activity will vary from 0 to plus 1 we are using 0 and plus 1 right so 0 to plus 1 somewhere in the middle the activity means agonist will have a maximum activity partial agonist will have a little lesser activity. simple now inverse agonist inverse agonist it will reach the effect but totally reverse effect see if intrinsic activity is 0 antagonist Rest every other thing, agonist. Intrinsic activity is 0, agonist. 0, agonist. 0, agonist. Three, agonist or antagonist? 0, antagonist. 0, antagonist. But any other thing is there, then we are going to call it as a agonist. Such as here, 0 to minus 1 intrinsic activity. 0 to minus 1 intrinsic activity. Totally reverse or a negative activity. But still activity is present inside the cell. We call this a mechanism. Action of now, in the mechanism of action of the receptor, let us understand the receptor types. Now, when you understand the receptor types, there are multiple ways to classify. I am going to take one simple way to classify. The first and most important receptors are called as GPCR receptors. Basically, they are using G protein, G protein, their mechanism of action. In this, they will have multiple subtypes. One of them is called as G. In GS receptor, yes, for stimulate means it will go and stimulate the enzyme called as adenyl cyclase adenyl cyclase so if it is stimulating adenyl cyclase it usually lead to what? increase of CAMP now most of you might be confused here you have a ATP that ATP will get converted into CAMP ATP will get converted into CAMP with the help of an enzyme called as adenyl okay then that is stimulating the enzyme okay then we have one more type there is called as GI they are going to inhibit the adenyl. Simple as that. They are going to inhibit the adenyl. Agreed. Agreed. Now, 
Now, let's go to the next important. What is that? There is one more thing that is only called as PO receptor. They basically increase the calcium in the cell. They increase the calcium in the cell. So, they will increase the intracellular calcium. There is one more type of receptor that is only called as GQ receptor. Now, GQ receptor will increase something called as IP3, inositol 3 phosphate or they will increase the substance called as diacylglycerol. These substances will also increase. If you notice here, after receptor is stimulated, either one substance came, AMP or calcium or IP3 or DAT. Now, all of these substances are called as secondary messengers. All of these substances are called as secondary messengers. So, these are the subtypes of the G protein couple receptors. A, G, Q, G, O, G, S. Okay. Now, let's go to the next important. There are next important receptors. We have the next important receptor called as ion channel receptor. Ion channel receptor. Now, what is this ion channel receptor? Now, this ion channel receptor operates with the help of, with the help of something called as ligand. With the help of something called as ligand. The, the most important thing, if you consider this is one cell. So, here I have a ion channel receptor. If I stimulate this receptor, it will allow the entry of some, for example, let's take chloride ion. Now, what happened? I stimulated the receptor because of that chloride ion came. So, this ion channel receptor stimulated the movement of the ion in or out of the cell. We call it ion channel receptor. Now, ion channel receptor, all of you remember one classic example that is your GABA receptor your GABA receptor. When you look at a GABA receptor, now GABA receptor, what type of receptor? They will, they are the receptors which will allow the chloride ion movement. Will allow the chloride ion movement. And this is your ion channel. Now, apart from that, there is something called as nuclear receptor. Nuclear receptor. Now, when you are talking about a nuclear receptor, please understand nuclear receptors are the receptors. The level of a nucleus, if you consider this as Okay, inside the cell, what do you have? Nucleus. On the nucleus, I will have some. On the nucleus, I will have some receptor. Now, these receptors will have some. So, these type of receptors are called as nuclear receptor. The examples are, for example, we have something called as PPAR receptor. That PPAR receptor. Paroxysmal proliferative activator receptor. Then we have something called as thyroid hormone. Thyroid receptor. Then we have something called as vitamin, vitamin, that is your vitamin, vitamin D3, your vitamin D3 receptor. All of them will have a nuclear receptor. Now, apart from that, there is one more type of receptor. Those receptors are called as enzymatic receptor, enzymatic. Now, basically, these receptors has to work. They work with the help of enzymes. The classic two examples you need to remember, there is one receptor called as tyrosine kinase receptor tyrosine kinase type of receptor so the tyrosine kinase receptors will will work for some hormone such as prolactin prolactin okay, such as insulin insulin okay then there is one more thing that is your growth hormone so growth hormone okay so look here the classic way to remember them is your P I G. So P I G pig is a way to remember your tyrosine. Right? But most importantly, the question will come to you people like this. All of the following except act via act via what is a tyrosine kinase receptor? Tyrosine kinase receptor. Kinase receptor except. So this one second. So, these receptors, there will be question, all of the following except question, okay. Option A, prolactin, option A, prolactin, option B, your insulin, option C, your growth hormone and option D will be your eucogon. So, now you people will remember what is that mnemonic, that mnemonic pig. So, if you remember the mnemonic pig, what will happen? They will get confused because whether it is growth hormone, whether it is glucogon, that will become a question, that will become confusion. 
so the correct answer for you people is your glucagon because glucagon does not act via tyrosine kinase okay there is one more type of example for this uh, receptor that is only called as janus kinase receptor janus kinase receptor janu janu janus kinase receptor are also called as jax they work in a called as jaxstat part they work in a place called as jaxstat so this is the importance about your receptors to renal right so once you understood about this let's go to the next important aspect uh, the next important aspect we are going to understand the autonomic nerve so so far what you discussed uh, is your general pharma there are very few questions uh, but very confusing ones uh, and major confusion of your pharmacology if you know autonomic nervous system the 50% of pharma will become very easy okay let's start with that now autonomic nervous system is divided into two types one of them is your sympathetic nervous system another one is your parasympathetic okay now sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system guys please understand consider this is a brain okay from the brain what is coming out spinal cord this okay now all the parasympathetic nerves they will arise they will arise from the brain you know from the brain. or all the parasympathetic nerves arise from the stake sacrum that is why we call it as a cranio sacral outflow cranio so either they start from the cranium okay so what are the cranium which work as a parasympathetic what are the cranial nerves which work as a parasympathetic anybody please tell me the cranio <laughs> cranial nerves which act as a parasympathetic are your two Seven, nine, ten. Among which I want you people to remember at least ten. That is your vagus nerve. That is vagus nerve. Okay. So there is a, two also has an effect on the craniosacral outflow, and there is a majorly there is a third cranium. Okay. Third and second both, but most importantly three also can. Okay. So for you people, I will remove all these three, and I want you to remember tenth cranium. Okay. Tenth cranial nerve is a very important. sacral outflow now when you look at a sympathetic nervous system either sympathetic nerves arise either from where either from the lumbar uh, lumbar area or from the thoracic uh, either from the thoracic area so there are two areas sympathetic nerves are coming from thorax and lumbar region that is why we call it as a thoraco lumbar outflow thoraco lumbar outflow so when you look at a thoraco lumbar outflow not lumbosacral that is thoraco lumbar outflow Okay. thoracic are from the <coughs> lumbar region thoraco lumbar outflow. okay now when you look at this uh, cranial nerves when you look at this cranial nerves so cranial nerves which work as a parasympathetic nerves the sympathetic nerves either arise from the spinal cord either arise from the spinal cord itself either arise from the thoracic region or from the lumbar region okay now when you understand about thoraco lumbar outflow now let's understand the effects of the each of them let's understand effect on the eye effect on the eye so sympathetic nervous system is active whenever for example you are running when you go to fight or for example if i push you into a dark room when you go into a dark room the first basic requirement of light means so you entered a dark room you want to look around the object if you want to look at an object what is required light is required so what your people will do people will start to dilate it will lead to midriasis so sympathetic nervous system will lead to mitriasis and parasympathetic nervous system to meiosis what is meiosis constriction of the pupil the pupil is getting smaller mitriasis is a dilation of how to remember mitriasis the word is bigger pupil is also getting bigger so if pupil dilates more light can enter into the eye so better that is the target of your nervous system to that okay now now the next important aspect uh, this is about the eye let's go to the next important what is that let's go to the oral cavity so oral cavity what exactly you need to oral cavity guys you need to understand saliva so when you are running your mouth becomes first sympathetic is active the salivation will be decreased okay now if you notice here i told you people about saliva saliva is decreased 
the same way in the eye also there is one segment called as lacrimation okay? lacrimation so let's look at the lacrimation together okay now when you want to call about lacrimation lacrimation is but what lacrimation is nothing but ear pain so lacrimation will be decreased so if you notice here with the sympathetic activity all the secretions are decreased but uh, lacrimation will also be increased salivation will also be increased with paracetamol so whenever your sympathetic is active secretions are decreased parasympathetic active secretions are increased this is a way to remember now if in this both cases if lacrimation is decreased it will lead to dry eye that is only called as xerophthalmia and it will lead to dry mouth that is called as xerostomia 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 means what dry mouth now apart from that let's go to the next important aspect that is your respiratory system respiratory system in the respiratory system you need to look when you are running what happens uh, your respiratory rate will be increased okay increase of the respiratory rate so please listen to me very carefully so you are running your body needs more oxygen if your body needs more oxygen what your bronchus has to do see bronchus is a pipe right so this is a pipeline if pipe dilates if pipe dilates pipe will become bigger if pipe becomes dilated what can happen more air can enter for that purpose only your body will do what bronchodilation 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 okay now when you are talking about parasympathetic parasympathetic what rest and digest when you are sleeping suddenly see imagine in the can you sleep like this sir? with a elevated respiratory rate no you cannot sleep so your respiratory rate has to go down because your body's oxygen requirement is less so what will happen parasympathetic activation decrease the respiratory rate and also it will also cause if you elevate the parasympathetic activity it can lead to severe also bronchoconstriction bronchoconstrict so basically what i am trying to tell you during parasympathetic activation bronchoconstriction is present if you excessively activate a parasympathetic severe bronchoconstriction here very good let's go to the next task what is that guys okay, so you understood about the respiratory system you understood about the oral canal let's go to your cardiovascular system in the cardiovascular system look at a heart now when you are running your heart is uh, heart is more blood means if you are running your body needs more blood your heart is pumping faster which will lead to increase of the heart rate along with the increase of the heart rate, will also lead to increase of force of contract force of First, your heart is trying to pump more blood more blood so for that purpose increase of the force of contraction now your heart is working more right if your heart is working more very good question very good if your heart is working more now what your heart will need heart is a cardiac muscle made out of cardiac muscle now cardiac muscle if it is working more it requires more oxygen automatically it will increase the o2 demand o2 demand so if you are running if you are doing any physical activity o2 demand of the heart will be increased o2 demand of the heart increased so if you look at a parasympathetic it will decrease the heart rate it will decrease the force of contraction and it will also decrease the o2 demand o2 demand okay now let's go to the next important aspect what is that that will be your sexual activity now what about sexual activity two important things one of them is your ejaculation ejaculation and one more thing is your erection hmm. tell me now erection is under the influence of which nervous system erection and ejaculation erection is under which in ejaculation under let's see this is a very important question which can be asked and you people should not make it sir ejaculation occurs under the influence of what about this <laughs> erection so guys ejaculation now guys are thinking oh, oh we need to answer carefully right let's see so guys ejaculation occurs under the influence of sympathetic nerve erection occurs under the influence of parasympathetic very good correct devan correct so erection and ejaculation now many are thinking okay i will increase my parasympathetic nervous system activity 
okay now let's go to the next important act what is that next important thing let's go to the DIT gastrointestinal tract okay now if you're talking about gastrointestinal tract very easy for you to understand what is that in the GIT in the GIT there is one thing called peristalsis there is one thing called as motility that is only peristalsis there is one thing called as sphincter tone okay along with that there is secretion three things are what are those motility motility okay sphincters okay now then motility sphincter then there is one more thing secretion what are the these are the now under the sympathetic activity under the sympathetic activity and under the parasympathetic what will happen let's see so when you look at a GIT in the GIT so think about this guys think about this very careful when you are running if I give you biryani also will you be able to swallow it properly when you are running no you will not be able to swallow it why you will not be able to swallow it let's start here sphincters are closed sphincters are closed if sphincters are closed, I eat the food, upper esophageal sphincter is closed, I eat the food, food will not pass through the GIT. So, what can happen? Aspiration can happen. Means, so during running, sphincters are closed. Sphincters are closed. Okay. Motility. So, if sphincters are closed, automatically food is not going inside. If food is not going inside, food movement will be there or not there? Food movement will not be there. Automatically, it will be decrease of the motility. If you are not eating food and sphincters are closed, is there any point of doing a secretion? No. So, secretion will be decreased. Simple. Now, parasympathetic. The parasympathetic, what happens? In parasympathetic, is a condition where you are resting happily. You can eat food and digest it. So, automatically, motility will be increased. Sphincters are open. So, you are able to swallow and you need to digest. So that is why what will happen? increase of the secretion that is why parasympathetic got its name rest and digest now rest and digest now. here very good very good let's go to the next aspect. what is that next aspect that is your urinary bladder what is that urinary bladder now when you're talking about urinary bladder urinary bladder i understand balloon what do i mean by balloon so look here this is your urinary bladder this is the neck of the urinary bladder. This is also the sphincter. Okay. Here you have a muscle. That is your tetrusa. Okay. Now, easy to understand what exactly happens. Guys, when you are running, will you be able to urinate? Now, many people will be confused. I will give a very easy way to understand. Now, whenever, if at all, guys can correlate this way. Okay. So, imagine a situation where you walk near a toilet, but the toilet is having a big line of 1 km. Big line of 1 km. Okay. Now, guys who are standing in the end, okay, they will be jumping. Why they will be jumping? Because they are trying to activate their sympathetic nervous system. What happens during a sympathetic? Guys, during a sympathetic nervous system activation, sphincter will be closed. The sphincter will be closed and muscle will be relaxed. Detrusor muscle relaxes, sphincter is closed. If sphincter is closed and muscle is relaxed, automatically what will happen? The urination will be decreased. So, detrusor muscle will relax. Muscle will relax. Okay. And a sphincter will be closed. Sphincter will be closed. But the same thing, same thing when you imagine, when you imagine that in where? In a situation, in a parasympathetic end. Muscle will contract. Okay. Sphincter will be open. Sphincter will be open. So, muscle is contracting from the top. Sphincter is opening from the top. urinate. So, this is the story of your effects of the autonomic nervous system. Sir, why we need to know the effects of the autonomic nervous system? You will understand it now. But before going there, let's understand our basics. Guys, if you notice here, I started one nerve. Okay. The nerve ended here. Here I have a ganglion. Here I have a ganglion. Okay, so this ganglion only I am going to call it as an atomic. Now, when you look at the atomic ganglion, so whatever the nerve fiber which is present before your before your ganglion, we call it as a pre ganglionic fiber. Any nerve fiber after ganglion, we call it as a post ganglion. Okay, so here also again pre ganglionic fiber and again post ganglionic fiber. So remember this much in the parasympathetic nervous system, pre ganglionic fibers are long and post ganglionic fibers. Okay, so this is a very important thing. 
okay so according to some places you might apply the wise words but physiologically speaking or anatomically speaking there are multiple types of sympathetic ganglia that might give you a little confusion so i would recommend you people to remember this much parasympathetic ganglion preganglionic fibers are long postganglionic postganglion short okay so this is a story of your autonomic ganglia now if you notice here let's consider this nerve this autonomic nerve is innervating your heart is innervating your heart now one nerve is ending here and another one is starting here between these two nerve there should be a neurotransmitter and again between the organ and organ and the nerve again it, there should be neurotransmitter so anywhere in the autonomic nerve system at the level of ganglia be it is parasympathetic we require what neurotransmitter at the level of what is that that is your organ we require a neurotransmitter so at the level of organ which is after the ganglion we call it as a post ganglionic neurotransmission and there is a before the ganglion here we call it as a pre ganglion okay that is a story now when you need to understand about the new neurotransmitters so you have sympathetic nervous system you have parasympathetic nervous system you have a pre ganglionic neurotransmitter and a post ganglionic neurotransmitter now let's understand what happened now preganglionic sympathetic neurotransmitter my dear students is your acetylcholine and same thing with your parasympathetic so for both of them you have sympathetic and parasympathetic at the level of a ganglion you have which is that neurotransmitter acetylcholine but sympathetic post ganglionic neurotransmitter usually your adrenaline nor adrenaline and there is one more substance which can also work that is your dopamine all three of them all to catecholamine are called as catecholamine but here in parasympathetic the post ganglionic neurotransmitter is also what acetylcholine if you notice here complete parasympathetic operates by acetylcholine we call it as a cholinergic system. that is why we call it as a cholinergic system which is basically operating with the help of your acetylcholine here now let's understand here post ganglionic here there are some exceptions here there are some exception so wherever we have an exception there might be a confusion remember a few places where it is a sympathetic neuron but a neurotransmitter is not your adrenaline nor adrenaline dopamine rather it will be your exception places where it will be acetylcholine in which places places like your sweat gland places like your sweat gland okay places like your adrenal medulla in these places in these places what will happen in these places acetylcholine will be the neurotransmitter so if you are in here there is one important aspect that is exceptional case acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter in places like sweat gland adrenal medulla in the also right so if this there is a acetylcholine see if there is some chemical receptor has to be there right let's study about the receptor so wherever there is a acetylcholine is present we require cholinoreceptor right listen to me very carefully acetylcholine act on act on which receptor they are called as cholinoreceptors cholinoreceptor okay so these cholinoreceptors are divided into two types there is something called as m cholinoreceptor there is something called as n cholinoreceptor okay now m cholinoreceptors are called as muscarinic receptors are called as muscarinic n cholinoreceptors are called as nicotinic receptors nicotinic receptor now what do i mean by nicotinic nicotinic receptor very easy guys listen to me very carefully here for example i invite all of you to one party i invite all of you to one party. now what happens here is that in the party in the party so there is some 50 people there 50 people who is drinking alcohol 50 people are drinking alcohol 50 people are not drinking alcohol here everybody 50 people are drinking for example juice 50 people are drinking alcohol 
and all the 100 people are having one common. What is that? They all are having food. So, the same way, this M cholinoreceptors will be stimulated specifically by one chemical muscarin, like people who are drinking alcohol. These nicotinic receptor will be stimulated exclusively by nicotine, exclusively by nicotine. So, the people who are drinking juice. But all the 100 people are eating what? Food. The same way, acetylcholine will stimulate both of them, muscarinic receptor and the nicotinic so, when you need to understand about this, let's go to the next important aspect. What is that? <laughs> next important aspect. So, muscarinic receptors are divided into one, M2, M3, okay, M4 and M5. So, what are the locations and what happens? So, all these five muscarinic receptors, all of them are present in the central nervous system. M4 and M5 present only in the central nervous system. So, what do I mean by this? Mean by this, M1 to M5, all of them are in the CNS. M4 and M5 present only in CNS means M1, M2, M3, they are located somewhere also. What are the places? The places M1 is located in the parietal cells. Parietal cells are located in the stomach. If you stimulate a M1 receptor, see M1 receptor is working through acetylcholine. If they are working through acetylcholine, automatically. Cholinergic system. What is the effect of cholinergic on the stomach? That is, that is, it will increase the acid production. It will increase the acid production. Okay. M2 receptor, they are located on your heart. So, what exactly happens here? In the heart, my dear students, in the heart, which receptor is located? M2 receptor is located. If I stimulate a M2 receptor, M2 receptor is working for the system, parasympathetic. What is the parasympathetic effect on the heart? Decrease the heart. Okay, M3 receptor. Now, remember, eyes also, there is an effect of parasympathetic. Mouth, there is an effect. There is an effect in the stomach. There is an effect in the blood. There is an effect in all the places. So, all other places. All other places. What are those others? Other places such as glands, such as glands, such as smooth muscles. Such as smooth muscle, all of them, there is your M3 receptor. Okay, now, now, M1, M2, M3 are. Now, when you understand about M1, M2, M3, M1 is a parietal cell, M2 is located in the heart, M3 is located in the other places. Now, nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are represented by N. By N. N for nicotinic receptor. N for nicotinic receptor, they are divided into two types. They are called as NN receptor. There is one more thing called as NM receptor. Now, NN receptors, guys, they are located in your autonomic ganglia. Autonomic ganglia. Autonomic ganglia, as soon as I say, so, you need to understand autonomic ganglion is present both in the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Both sympathetic ganglion and parasympathetic ganglion will have your NN receptor. Now, let's go to the NM receptor. NM receptors are located in the neuromuscular condition. Neuromuscular. Okay. So, this is the story of your, what is that? Acetylcholine receptor, right? Cholinone. Okay. So, if parasympathetic activity has to occur, all of the activity goes by this. Here everybody able to follow me guys able to follow me let's see okay so if at all we are looking at this receptor let's go to the next aspect what is that the next aspect there guys let's start with the first group of tracks they are only called as Cholinomimetics. Cholinomimetics. Cholinomimetics are also called as cholinergic agonists. Are also called as cholinergic agonists. Now, what are these cholinergic agonists? Guys, cholinergic agonists. Now, we need to understand one important aspect. These cholinergic agonists are a group of. Cholinergic, very good. Guys. Cholinergic agonists are a group of. Which will increase the parasympathetic which will increase the parasympathetic activity in a basic terms. They will increase the parasympathetic activity. So, how exactly they are going to work? What are the uses? What are the side effects? Let's go, go to them. Okay. So, since we are doing a quick review here, I will be giving you people very much important things. Okay. So, let's start with that. So, all these cholinomimetics to understand, let's start with a cholinergic. 
in a cholinergic neuron look here this is a cholinergic neuron inside a cholinergic neuron okay so, so this is a presynaptic presynaptic neuron or a presynaptic membrane we call it as a postsynaptic right whenever the nerve is stimulated it will allow the entry of calcium this calcium will cause the release of the acetylcholine but i want you to understand this release of the acetylcholine we call it as a exocytosis exocytosis so this exocytosis occurs with the help of a protein called as snare protein what is a snare protein <laughs> now this snare protein will help the acetylcholine so this snare proteins can be inhibited by your botulinum botulinum so botulinum toxin what is the mechanism of action they inhibit the snare protein which will decrease the release of your acetylcholine here everybody continue now this acetylcholine can act upon for example if there is a m cholinoreceptor m cholinoreceptor if there is a n cholinoreceptor n cholin so postsynaptic membrane can be an organ postsynaptic membrane can be a neuron postsynaptic membrane can be a muscle all of them are possible now look here this acetylcholine is metabolized by an enzyme called as acetylcholine ester acetylcholine ester is an enzyme which will metabolize the acetylcholine into acetate plus choline acetate plus choline okay now this choline can be used again for the main fine but I want you to understand this acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme which is present in the cell which is in the acetylcholine. Okay. Now let's start with the cholinomimetic drugs. So we have some drugs called as direct acting drugs. What is it? Direct acting drugs. There is one more drug called as indirect acting. Indirect. Now direct acting drugs and indirect acting drugs. Look here. Direct acting, what are these? These direct acting drugs basically they are agonist. They are agonist. Agonist to what? Agonist to one of the most important agonist usually to M receptors. Usually to M receptors. What do I mean by agonist to M receptor? I mean directly go bind with the M colony and stimulate those. Okay. Now indirect, what is the mechanism of action? Yes, this is a very important the very important aspect uh, mechanism of action they will inhibit acetyl choline ester so let's go back and see if i block this enzyme acetyl choline ester i have blocked which enzyme now what will happen automatically acetyl choline will not be if it is not metabolized acetyl choline quantity will be increased right so now more acetyl choline more activation of all the receptor which are possible so what is that inhibition of acetylcholine stress increase acetylcholine increase parasite right so these are the indirect acting now now when you need to understand indirect acting they will inhibit the acetylcholine stress which will lead to increase of the acetyl acetylcholine which will increase the parasympathetic activity agreed they will also stimulate the N receptor. Okay. Now, when you need to understand indirect action, they are going to bind with the acetylcholine stress. That is why they are also known as anti choline stress. Now, anti choline stress drugs, most of the people will get confused thinking that they are not anti choline, rather, they are anti choline stresses. They are working as a cholinomimetics, my dear working as what cholinomimetics now now what are the direct acting drugs direct acting drugs we have drugs such as carbacol we have drugs such as carbacol we have one more drug called as ethanacol ethanacol then we have one more drug what is that one more drug?
sorry guys sorry guys there was some small technical glitch so slide got changed sorry so we were talking about anti cholinesterases anti cholinesterases are which group of drugs cholino mimetics group of drugs cholino mimetics now we have carbacol okay then apart from that uh, we have one more drug that is your methacholin that is your methacholin okay apart from that we have one more drug called as pilocarpine what is that pilocar so these are the drugs or your what is that direct acting and let's talk about indirect acting indirect acting drugs we have drugs such as, such as neostigmine neostigmine we have a drug called as a pyridostigmine pyridostigmine okay apart from pyridostigmine we have one more drug that is ever that is ever pyridostig pyridostig okay apart from pyridostigmine we have one more drug called as galantam now don't panic by looking at the names i'll teach now apart from galantamine what else we have apart from galantamine one more drug called as rivastigmine rivastigmine apart from rivastigmine we have one more drug called as naprazil so naprazil okay apart from that there is one more drug called as now please listen to me among all these drugs these drugs are very separate ones why i wrote them here these are used for alzheimer disease used for alzheimer alzheimer but alzheimer disease uh, the drug of choice is for the very important question what is the drug of choice for drug of choice for the drug of choice for alzheimer the answer should be donapazil donapazil now donapazil is donapazil is the drug of choice for alzheimer disease then we have one more that is that is your tac Tacrine, but reverse treatment not used. The drug used is donapazil. Clear, everybody? Will you answer this question? Drug of choice for Alzheimer's disease is your donapazil. Okay. Now, guys, let's understand the uses of this drug. So, uses of these drugs, I will put every use in one place. You will understand very easily. So, this is a very important one. What I am trying? Uses are very very important. First and most important. Post operative urinary retention urinary retention and ivs what happens is that when we do a surgery after surgery the person to restore the bowel movement and person should be able to urinate up see you did a surgery after surgery some people what will happen urine will not come out so in which what happens is that parasympathetic activation not there so if you focus and understand if you stimulate parasympathetic contraction of the detrusor detrusor contracts urine will come out so can i use this drug yes cholinomimetic increase the parasympathetic activity so contracting the urinary bladder increase the urination so can i use it yes i can use it in the urinary retention and ileus means what is that in which the intestine motility is not restored intestine motility is not restored this condition for both of these the the best drug i can use you need to remember that is your bethanacholine bethanacol bethan now how to remember bethanacol bowel and bowel and bladder for so, bowel and bladder dysfunction after surgery we are going to use what is the drug bethanacol okay there is one more thing that is your that is your most important is alzheimer we already said okay apart from that apart from that jogren syndrome what is it jogren syndrome now jogren syndrome is a very very important ask the frequently and you need to understand for jogren syndrome the patient will have a dry mouth okay there is a dry mouth a mouth has gotten dry if mouth is dry what will happen why this mouth will dry because jogren's disease is a autoimmune disorder autoimmune disorder in which there are two antibodies can be anti ro antibody and anti law anti okay now this condition what happens is that all the glands undergo fibrosis now salivary gland undergo fibrosis salivation will 
if parasympathetic is activated what will happen salivation will be increased so for jogren syndrome dry mouth we use a drug called as sevamilin what is it sevamilin is it sevamilin remember okay apart from jogren syndrome my dear students we can use them that is in the myasthenia gravis what is it myasthenia gravis now what is this myasthenia gravis the best drug is pyridostic the best drug is pyridostigmine. Now, why pyridostigmine? Because pyridostigmine, no crossing of no crossing of the blood brain barrier. If it will not cross the blood brain barrier, what happens here? See, when I use a anticholinesterase drug, it will increase the acetylcholine. If acetylcholine increase, it will stimulate the NM receptor. In the myasthenia gravis, what happens is the destruction of destruction of nm receptor if nm receptors are destroyed the treatment will be what is that increase acetylcholine if you increase acetylcholine increase stimulation of increase stimulation of your nm receptor so that is the reason so in myasthenia gravis pyridostigmine is a better drug because see all the muscles are located in one thing apart from that the one more thing the reason is long acting so for this reason only we are going to use pyridostigma okay? hope everybody able to understand now apart from myasthenia gravy where else we can apart from myasthenia gravy there are some other uses we need to make them these drugs especially pylocarpine pylocarpine used in the glaucoma patient now, glaucoma treatment is a different strategy, but can use. Agree. Okay. So, these are the very many, very important, uh, very important uses. Uh, so, myasthenia gravis, Alzheimer, myasthenia gravis, Jogren syndrome. Apart from that, uh, you need to remember post operative urinary retention and ILS. Uh, the last and most important possible, so there is something called as methacholine. Methacholine challenge test okay now i want you people to answer me methacholine challenge test used in the diagnosis tell me guys let's see i'm looking for your comments methacholine challenge test is used for is used for what is that that is which disease diagnosis hmm. tell me So, Kiran Gopal says asthma and other says nothing. Come on guys, give me an answer. Myasthenia, okay. Any other answers? So, the correct answer is used in the bronchial asthma diagnosis. Bronchial asthma diagnosis. Disorder, bronchial asthma diagnosis. Here everybody. So, this is the most important aspect, methacholine standard. There is one more diagnostic method that is your tensilon test. Tensilon test. So tensilon test we use. We use a short acting, a short acting anticholinesterase. Anticholinesterase. So this short acting anticholinesterase. This short acting anticholinesterase. Which is that short acting anticholinesterase? That is your hydrophonium. Hydrophonium. Okay. You use a hydrophonium. So there are only two possible. So, what is that? The patient, uh, patient, tensilon test is used for which disorder? First thing, myasthenia, myasthenia gravis. Now, in the myasthenia gravis patient, patient come to you, complaints of weakness, complaints of drooping of eyes, etc. Now, after giving hydrophonium, symptoms improve. Symptoms, symptoms improve. If symptoms improve, if symptoms improve, we call it as positive positive tensilon test or a positive if there is a negative means no improvement of no improvement of it now if there is no improvement of the symptom that is negative if there is a positive that is a diagnosis of myasthenia myasthenia now what is this no improvement there is no improvement we are trying 
that is usually cholinergic usually the word cholinergic now apart from cholinergic crisis it can also be come some other disorders such as for example lambert eater there will be okay, adroponin okay so this is the story of your and of cholinomy once we understood about the cholinomy let's go to the next important ones they are called as anti cholinergic anti cholinergic so what is this anti cholinergic so at the end of anti cholinergics i will teach you people about that that is your combination of neostigma the for, for the snake bite and op okay now anti cholinergic when you are learning about anti cholinergic guys anti cholinergics are also called as cholinergic antagonists cholinergic now this cholinergic antagonist my dear student they will do what they are going to block the parasympathetic they are going to block the parasympathetic so if they are blocking the parasympathetic let's see so when they are blocking the parasympathetic activity they start with one organ in the central nervous system in the central nervous system if you block m receptor if you block m receptors what will happen so if you block that will be done with the help of a drug called as your hyoscine 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 now hyoscine is also called as scopolamine scopolamine now scopolamine is used used for the treatment of what is a disorder can anybody tell me scopolamine where do we use scopolamine is used please tell me scopolamine is used for the treatment of motion sick motion sickness motion now actually is exactly in the form of a transdermal patch in the form of a transdermal patch and for example you are talking about motion when person is going for example what is that for example some forest area trip or something now when do we apply this patch is it before starting of trip or after the symptoms so this should be very important before start of the symptom go start of the symptoms. before even symptoms will get started apply that is your scopolam okay then apart from that central nervous system let's come to the next thing what is that eye in the eye my dear student what will happen what happens is that they will block the m receptor especially m3 receptor if m3 receptors are blocked in the eye that will lead to what i told you people parasympathetic nervous system contraction of the pupil meiosis now if i block it midriasis so it will lead to midriasis okay? now midriasis will occur but along with that that will also lead to cycloplasia cycloplasia what is cycloplasia it is a paralysis of the muscle paralysis of the ciliary okay now mitriatics used in the eye what are those drugs now, now listen to me very carefully guys it's very easy for you to understand we have atropine we have atropine we have homotropin we have homotropin okay we have one more drug cyclopentolate cyclopentolate okay there is one more drug called as tropica now what are the mcqs from here now very easy to understand atropine is a long acting atropine is a long acting and tropicamide is a short acting is a short acting so since it is a short acting drug it can be used in adults it can be used in adults so for what for the for the purpose of fundos for example if you want to check retinoid for example if you want to measure the so you can use it. For the examination of the eye, you are going to use which drug? That is your tropical is used in the adults. In the children, atropine is used. In the children, atropine is used. Can anybody tell me why atropine is used in the children? Because, because strong ciliary muscle. Strong ciliary. In the children, there is a very strong ciliary muscle. We need to give a very powerful agent. That powerful agent, my dear student. Atropine that is why the long acting the eye to give atropine in the children, but tropicamide is used in the adult because weaker ciliary muscle children 
most importantly we need the duration short period of time is used in the adults why because it is a short attention is a short attention okay so we need to focus here midriasis with the cyclopasia means whenever you use anticholinergic drug cholino blocker automatically cause cyclopasia let's go to the next aspect what is that in the respiratory tract the respiratory when you look at a respiratory guys if you block a m3 receptor it will lead to bronchodilation bronchodilation why bronchodilation very easy sympathetic bronchoconstriction that used to happen with the help of m3 that used to happen with the help of m3 now what i did i blocked that m3 automatic bronchodilation so they are used used for copd used for copd and if they are used for the copd now what other drugs you that is your ipratropium ipratropium and thiotropium thiotropium now ipratropium and thiotropium most important question well so there are two drugs now among these two drugs which is a long acting remember the long acting drug is your thiotropin long acting drug thiotropin now sir if i am using a drug in copd can i use it in the asthma of course copd and uh, but most importantly i want your attention to be paid for the copd the best drugs usually used are your mp blockers ipratropium and thiotropin long acting copd is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease caused by caused by clear everybody okay now apart from that let's go to the next important that is your heart now in the heart my dear students we have m3 receptor if i stimulate a m3 receptor what will happen it will decrease the heart rate it already if i block a m3 receptor it will increase the so if a patient having use where it will use it is increasing the heart rate use is what used for bradycardia used for bradycardia apart from bradycardia it is also used for av block av block what is the drug on the heart the drug is your tropin so in the heart there is one small change make it in the heart we have m2 receptor now m2 receptor we are talking about atropin we are talking about atropin if you look here on m2 also there is action by atropin one also there is m3 also there so atropin has all the okay so heart m2 receptor okay now the next important let's go to your parietal cell parietal cell which has a m1 receptor if you stimulate a m1 receptor increase the acid very good if you block a m1 receptor it will decrease the acid. that's it simple as that if it is decreasing the acid it can be used in peptic ulcer but do we use it in we don't why because have a superior drug so if they are used in peptic ulcer disease m1 blockers this m1 blockers the drugs are your pirenzepine pirenzepine and there is one more drug called as tilenza got it everybody here so this is the most important parents of the lens now there is other ones other ones m3 blockers on the git if you block the m3 receptor on the git we have a drug called as a dicyclomin what is that dicyclomin there is one more drug clidinium is it clidinium these two drugs are m3 blockers in the git basically they are used for spastic spastic okay so among these i want you to remember some of the most important what is the best drug used for a av block they are going to ask you you need to mark it as best drug not the best okay okay for av block best treatment is pacemaker best treatment is pacemaker so <coughs> best treatment is your pacemaker best drug is your okay 
Now M3 blocker. M3 blockers in the GAT. Let's go to the next task. What is that? Let's go to the next important location. That is your urinary bladder. So urinary bladder, guys, please listen to me very carefully. Confusing as well. Consider this is your bladder. In the bladder, which receptors are there? M3. So if I stimulate a M3 receptor, bladder will contract. Bladder will. If bladder contracts, urine will come out. This much. If I have a patient with a hyperactive, hyperactive, hyperactive bladder means urination. For that patient, what I have to do? I need to block this M3 receptor. So exactly in the urinary bladder, where do we? A patient who is having which disorder? Hyperactive bladder. Hyperactive bladder. Now for the hyperactive bladder, we have drugs such as oxybutyn. Oxybutyn, oxybutyn. Apart from oxy, we have one more drug called as dorifenas. Sorry. Okay. We have one more drug, dorifenas. Dorifenas. We have one more drug called as tolefenas. Tolefen. There is one more drug called as rospi. Rospi. Now, if I would, if I want to tell people to remember. Remember two drugs. What are the two drugs? Dorifenes and your oxybutyn. These two. Now, there is one more drug, solifenes. Okay, among this three. Now, the question is like this. Which of the following Drug not used for hyperactive. Hyperactive option A oxybutynin. Oxybutynin option B mepramine. Mepramine option C dabagron. The background option D not tell me guys wait a minute now I, I want to teach you people a very interesting new concept okay so for that purpose only I want to answer I want you people to answer this question okay tell me the answer later. So, somebody says D and somebody says imipramine. I am asking which of the following is not used. Very careful. Which of the following not used. Okay. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Let's see. Take a guess. Now, if you don't know the answer, A, B, C, D, anything you can answer. But I want you people to answer. Just give me an answer. Yeah. Only two people as, is guessing what is that D and imipramine. C, okay. Any other answers? So, please remember which of the following drug not used is nortriptyline. Which of the following not used is nortriptyline. Nortriptyline is not used. Imipramine is a tricyclic antidepressant used in hyperactive bladder. It is a beta 3 adrenergic drug. Beta 3 acting drug, beta 3 acting drug, it is also used. Okay, this is a M3 drug, M3 blocker also used. So remember, though it is, this is one important aspect. Imipramine is a tricyclic and but still used for, used for what is that? Hyperactive bladder, but not triptyline, though it is a, though it is what? It is a tricyclic and but which is not used, I want you to can you remember this much? So, what are the drugs we use for hyperactive bladder? Oxy, repeat with me, oxybutynin, oxybutynin toltaradin, solifenacin, dorifenacin, trospin. All these come under one group. M3 blockers used for hyperactive bladder. Then, tricyclic antidepressant used is imipramine. Then, there is beta-3 adrenergic drug that is your mirabatron. These are the three drugs which are widely used for your, what is that? 
ஹைப்பர் ஆக்டிவ் பிளாடர் ஹைப்பர் ஆக்டிவ் பிளாட் கிளியர் திஸ் இஸ் அ ஸ்டோரி ஆஃப் யுவர் ஹைப்பர் ஆக்டிவ் பிளாடர் அண்ட் யுவர் கொலினர் கொலினர்ஜிக் ஆன்டாகனிஸ்ட் ஸோ கொலினர்ஜிக் ஆன்டாகனிஸ்ட் திஸ் ஆர் த மோஸ்ட் so once you understood about this cholinergic antagonist then we will be shifting towards your adrenergic what is it adrenergic adrenergic so before starting adrenergic before starting adrenergic so we need to understand important aspect that important aspect of what is that about the adrenergic right so adrenergic drugs to understand that let's start with a very important basic that is your adrenergic adrenergic now listen to me we have one amino acid called as tyrosine now this fellow tyrosine will get converted into dopamine now from dopamine what will be released that will be your noradrenaline and from noradrenaline what can be formed adrenaline okay now whenever i stimulate this neuron what will happen adrenaline noradrenaline will release now they will go on to stimulate the post synaptic membrane alpha and beta alpha okay so adrenergic receptor a complete your adrenergic system works with alpha and beta. now you people will have it or what is it that is your sympathetic system so let's start with the adrenoreceptor basic concept is your adreno receptor now when you want to understand about the adreno receptor see guys sir, this is a quick review so i'm not going into much details of adrenergic neuron rather we are going into most important okay now let's start with the adreno now when we are talking about adreno receptor we have something called as alpha adreno called as alpha adreno now when you talking about alpha receptor this alpha receptor can be subdivided into alpha 1 receptor there is alpha 2 now let's start with the alpha 1 receptor now when you need to understand about a alpha 1 receptor alpha 1 receptor is further divided into alpha 1a alpha 1b okay there is one more thing called as alpha 1d but which is not which is less important for you people remember this much is alpha 1a and alpha 1b okay now alpha 1a and here they are located. alpha 1b is located in the blood and alpha 1a is located in the urinary blood alpha 2 receptor now alpha 2 receptor is located in the presynaptic presynaptic now in presynaptic membrane what do i mean by this look here where exactly we have which receptor yes sir alpha 2 now when you are talking about a alpha 2 receptor so this is a post synaptic okay? presynaptic now alpha 2 is which type of receptor presynaptic if i am telling you a presynaptic receptor every time adrenaline is released this adrenaline can go and this adrenaline can go and stimulate which receptor alpha 2 once alpha 2 receptor is stimulated what it will do it will decrease the release of neurotransmitter it is more like a negative feedback mechanism more like a negative feedback mechanism what happens that the release of the neurotransmitter will decrease as a result of the presynaptic alpha 2 receptor okay now there is one more thing alpha 2 receptor also located on the blood vessel okay so let's understand all of this now whenever sympathetic activation is there alpha 1 and alpha 2 receptors get stimulated what are they when alpha 1 gets stimulated my dear student alpha 1 stimulation will lead to urinary bladder sphincter contraction urinary bladder sphincter contraction what do i mean by this stimulate a sympathetic nervous system sphincter will be closed exactly how exactly you are getting it as a result of alpha 1 then there is one more thing what is that one more in the blood vessel there is a vasoconstrictor 
is a vasoconstriction. So automatically it lead to increase of the BP. It lead to increase of the BP. Now alpha 2 receptor on the blood vessel again they will also increase the BP. But you need to understand there is free synaptic receptor. Free synaptic receptor will decrease the release of the adrenaline noradrenaline. Less adrenaline noradrenaline decrease of the sympathetic activity if there is a decrease of the sympathetic activity automatically there will be decrease of the blood pressure so if we stimulate alpha 2 receptor at which level at a neuron level there will be what there will be decrease of the bp okay let's go to the next type of that is your beta adrenaline beta adrenal receptors are divided beta adrenal receptors are divided into what Beta adrenal receptors are divided into beta 1, there is beta 2 and there is beta 3. So, what are the three types? Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Now, beta 1 receptors are located in your heart. Beta 1 are located in your heart. Apart from the heart, beta 1 also located in the kidney. Beta 1 also located in the kidney. Now, the next important beta 2 receptor. Beta 2 receptors are located in the bronchus blood vessel and your uterus and beta 3 receptors major location is adipose tissue apart from that there is a evidence suggests that there is your bladder that is your beta 3 drugs are used for the hyperactive blood now once you know this much guys beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 receptors now we need to understand the adrenergic agonist. adrenergic agonist so when we need to understand about the adrenergic agonist Adrenergic agonists are a group of drugs. What they will do? They will increase the activity of uh, sympathetic nervous system. If sympathetic nervous system is activated, what will they do? They will lead to sympathetic activation. If there is a sympathetic activation, there will be excessive sympathetic activity means heart rate will increase. Okay, there is a respiratory rate increase. Uh, there is a bronchodilation. So, we are going to use them as a therapeutic purpose. Right? So, when you need to understand about these drugs, so let us learn about this important aspect. What is that important aspect? Guys, this is very easy for you to understand. So, before going even to the drugs, all these adrenal receptors can be stimulated by adrenaline. They can be stimulated by noradrenaline. Now, let us understand the effect of adrenaline, noradrenaline. First, then we will go to the other drug. Adrenaline will stimulate alpha 1, alpha 2. Beta 1, beta 2. Okay. Now, noradrenaline will stimulate alpha 1, alpha 2 and beta 1. No action on the beta 2 receptor. This is a very important aspect to remember. Right. So, if you need to understand this, this is about adrenaline noradrenaline. Okay. Sir, why you are telling all this? Let us put all this into one important place that is only your vasomotor phenomenon. Vasomotor phenomenon of of base. What is this vasomotor phenomenon? So please understand this. Normally, what happens, and that's one hundred percent will be present. I like it. That much important. Okay. Now, what do I mean by this vasomotor phenomenon? To understand that, if we stimulate beta two on the blood vessel. So, most of you people are thinking now, what exactly I am talking about? The effect I am talking about only and only, where exactly? On the blood vessel, my dear. Where exactly? On the blood vessel. So, on the blood vessel, if beta 2 is stimulated, it will cause vasodilation. Vasodilation. Okay. Now, in the blood vessel, if alpha 1 is stimulated, it will lead to vasoconstriction. Now, there is a contradictory information. Why, sir? Look here. Adrenaline will stimulate alpha 1 also and beta 2 also. So, 1 is increasing the BP, 1 is decreasing the BP. So, this complication is called by this scientist Dales. He gave us one clear cut explanation. That explanation in on the blood vessel, this occurs exclusively on the blood vessels. So, in the blood vessel, adrenaline at a high concentration, adrenaline at a high concentration will activate. Alpha 1 receptor lead to increase of the BP, lead to increase of the BP, okay. Adrenaline at a low concentration will stimulate beta 2 receptor 
beta 2 receptor will cause vasodilation which will lead to decrease of the blood pressure which will lead to decrease of the blood pressure so adrenaline at high concentration alpha 1 increase bp at low concentration beta 2 decrease okay so exactly what happens if adrenaline injected if adrenaline injected what will happen initially this was the flat line of bp initially bp will be raised later bp will come back to the normal and bp will fall down and this is the story so in this stage where there is alpha effect and here there is a beta 2 effect this is only your vasomotor phenomenon of cancer but what is the mcq if <coughs> adrenaline is given if adrenaline is given in presence of a alpha block presence of a alpha block okay if there is a presence of a alpha blocker what is going to happen so if alpha there is a blockade of the alpha receptor now if blockade of the alpha receptor what is going to happen automatically your adrenaline will act on your beta 2 adrenaline act on your beta 2 receptor if adrenaline act on the beta 2 automatically it will lead to decrease of the bp this is a very important question if adrenaline is given in the presence of alpha blocker the end summary is the decrease of the bp this is a very important mcq which has been asked so please remember adrenaline given in the presence of alpha blocker bp will fall bp will fall clear now <clears throat> this can even be noticed evidently in one more place called as pheochromocytoma. we will come to that come to that later now let's go to the next aspect what is that next aspect yeah. guys uh, so if adrenergic drugs are there let's talk about first important drug i want to talk about is your adrenaline what is that your adrenaline now adrenaline what are the uses of the adrenaline so adrenaline directly it will go to alpha receptor if alpha receptors are directly stimulated what will happen if beta receptors are directly stimulated what will happen so for that purpose let's go back and learn about the effects of each receptor right in the alpha in the alpha we see it but in the beta look here in the heart if beta 1 is stimulated it will increase the heart rate it will increase the force of contraction and it will also increase the o2 requirement to demand as we discussed autonomic nervous in the kidney if beta receptors are activated especially beta 1 is activated that will stimulate your ras system that will stimulate your ras system here now in the bronchus it will cause bronchodilation okay in the blood vessel it will cause vasodilation vasodilation in the uterus it will cause uterine relaxation these are the effects so effects of the beta receptors in the body so let's go back here when we are talking about adrenaline adrenaline is used for your anaphylactic anaphylactic shock now in the anaphylactic shock the pathology is the pathology is increase of histamine there is an increase of histamine this increased histamine will lead to bronchoconstriction and vasodilation so dilation okay so these are the two problems now how can we treat it exactly opposite treatment what are the opposite treatment? opposite treatment is very simple the patient is having anaphylactic shock the problem is bronchoconstriction and vasodilation if you give adrenaline if you give adrenaline automatically exactly opposite effect will be yielded that is the use of your anaphylactic shock that is your adrenaline your adrenaline now adrenaline there is having one more use but it can also be used in cardiac arrest can also be used in cardiac arrest cardiac arrest okay it can also be combined with the local anesthetic but this effect will be dose dependent not dose dependent and what are the doses we will learn about it after a shot all right all right guys so we have taken a long enough break but the thing is it's not about the duration of the break so continuously we were receiving messages from your side as well that voice is not being clear so we are trying to rectify it but with that much being said so we were talking about adrenaline when we were talking about adrenaline adrenaline is a drug which is not just a drug but also present in the human body now 
when we need to understand we have to understand about adrenaline right so we have something called as anaphylactic shock we have something called as cardiac arrest and it is also used with a local anesthetic remember combined with the combined with local anesthetic why do we combine with a local anesthetic the mcq will be asked why do you combine because adrenaline will prolong the action prolong the duration of prolong the duration of action of what of your local anesthetic right so we have three different uses so automatically the question will be what are the three different dilutions are three different dose dependent actions so we need to understand guys uh, listen to me very carefully now this adrenaline can be diluted into 1 is to 100 so when it is diluted as 1 is to 100 where do we use it earlier i haven't mentioned it so where exactly we are going to use it for the bronchial asthma bronchial asthma right so in the bronchial asthma we are going to use it okay now listen to me in bronchial asthma the dilution is 1 is to 100 now for example 1 is to 1000 1 is to 1000 where do we use it we use 1 is to 1000 in which this is in the anaphylactic shock where do we use it anaphylactic shock right now apart from that there is one more thing that is 1 is to that is your most important thing that is 1 is to 10,000 1 is to 10,000 we have one dilution okay then apart from that 1 is to 10,000 and there is one more thing that is 1 is to 1 lakh that 1 lakh might vary 1 is to 1 lakh let's keep here okay now 1 is to 1 lakh let's keep here but the important aspect is what 1 is to 1 lakh this dose will vary so this dose where do we use it this is used for the local anesthetic combination okay now when we are looking at a 1 is to 10,000 combination 1 is to 10,000 is used for the cardiac arrest cardiac arrest if you notice here you can remember it like this inhalation 1 is to 100 okay for example anaphylactic shock 1 is to 1000 where we are using what is that intramuscularly where do, how do we use it intramuscular intramuscular and 1 is to 10000 for the cardiac arrest usually use iv route of administration and there is one more thing what is that that is your 1 is to 1 lakh that is used for the combination with the local anesthetic all right is there any break of voice still guys respond all right <clears throat> let's continue so we understood about adrenaline okay we understood about the, the dosage forms okay that the dose not even exactly dosage form let's speaking specifically speaking doses dilution okay then let's go to the next aspect now adrenaline is such a drug we understood about it let's go to the next important that is your noradrenaline what is it noradrenaline now when you're talking about noradrenaline has no effect on the beta 2 receptor has no effect on which receptor on the beta 2 receptor when there is no effect on the beta 2 receptor so you need to remember noradrenaline no significant change no significant change of no significant change of heart rate you need to remember this though we are talking about noradrenaline though we are talking about noradrenaline so though it is a nothing related to beta 1 receptor but though it is beta 2 related action but still the end summary will be what is a no significant change of the heart rate all right so if there is no significant change of the heart rate how this works this works like this for example adrenaline what happens it is a type of potent a very strong vasoconstrictor so it is a potent vasoconstrictor now this potent vasoconstrictor will activate alpha 1 receptor will lead to increase of the bp if there is an increase of the bp it will stimulate one receptor called as baroreceptor it will stimulate something called as baroreceptor if it will stimulate a baroreceptor what will happen is that it will stimulate in turn vagus nerve the end summary is vagus nerve if vagus nerve is activated if vagus nerve is activated it will try to decrease the heart rate all right 
but uh, nor adrenaline what is that nor adrenaline will stimulate which receptor beta 1 receptor what is the effect of beta 1 receptor to increase the heart rate so if you notice here the significant change will be there one is trying to increase one is trying to decrease the end summary will remain as a no significant change of the heart rate that is why noradrenaline no significant change of the heart rate but noradrenaline only and only acts upon what increasing the bp if it is increasing the bp this drug will be used only and only for one condition called as shock now as soon as i call it shock shock doesn't mean uh, shock doesn't mean mental shock so don't confuse throughout medical field you need to remember shock means what shock means low blood pressure so low blood pressure we need to elevate the blood pressure for that purpose we can use noradrenaline so if they haven't mentioned the type of the shock then you are going to proceed to what is that that is that is your what is that that is your noradrenaline all right so so with this much being said guys so there is a lot of voice uh, which has been breaking and lot of words are getting missed so we don't want you to give get this uh, information lost or information confused so for your sake uh, we will we will do one thing we will resolve our technical issues then we will get back to you and all the schedule etc will be posted for you people all right thank you guys